Hello, hello. All right, good morning, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, welcome, everybody, to our third annual series of Tech Talks here at the Red Wire booth, the originals. Um, today we have uh, a very special panel to kick things off for Space Symposium. We have lots of people here that really don't need an introduction, but I'll start. We have joining us former NASA Administrator Jim Bryanstein, also former NASA Deputy Administrator Jim Moorhard, and of course our very own Chief Growth Officer Mike Gold. Take it away. Thank you so much, Terry. It is wonderful to have my two favorite gyms here. This is a family reunion, like Beatles reunion show. You can't get better than this. So take this, Beatles. We got the two gyms back in town. So happy to have both of you here. You know, the accomplishments of the past administration was nothing short of stunning. And I can't thank both of you enough for everything you did for NASA, for America, for the country. And you both look happier and smiling more now that you're out of the agency, though. So. Not at all. And back together. That's right. Good, good to be back together. So, you know, this is going to be a difficult panel because I'll say, Jim, kick it off to you, but Jim B. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of get the conversation started. Um, the United States of America is really at a crossroads. We need to make sure that we have habitation in low Earth orbit. And I know there are a lot of private companies, commercial companies with private capital that are helping the United States achieve that objective. Here's what we know. We know that the International Space Station is not going to last forever. We know that we have to have no gap in low Earth orbit given the importance of all of the activities that we um, have been fostering over decades on the International Space Station. So we need, we need to continue to see private capital flowing into commercial space stations. At the same time, we need to see much more support from the U.S. government for these public-private partnerships that are ultimately going to enable us to, to not have a gap in low Earth orbit. And in fact, when we consider our biggest competitor on the world stage, China, they've got a brand new space station. So as we think about what comes next, we need private companies like Redwire and uh, so many others. Uh, we can go through the list, but at the end of the day, uh, the United States is at a crossroads. We need to make sure that we are moving forward with commercial habitation in low Earth orbit. So Jim, you did so much for commercial during your tenure as NASA Administrator the suborbital commercial crew program. The first purchase of lunar regolith by NASA for $15,000, I think that was. That program, by the way, is about to come to fruition with the landing of ice space on the moon. I didn't think we ever saw that that program would actually become a reality, certainly not as quickly as it is in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so the, the idea was at the conclusion of the Google Lunar X Prize, which nobody won, how do we keep those players that came into the game with all of the, the private capital that they had, how do we make sure that if, if China's going to be on the moon tomorrow, how do we make sure that we're on the moon as soon as possible? And, and of course, we, we decided to do public-private partnerships with commercial lunar payload services. Um, and now we're seeing the, the results of that. And, and yes, it's intuitive machines, it's Firefly, it's iSpace, um, it's, it's others. Um, but the idea is you know, the United States of America needs to take advantage of the best everything that we have, uh, the best of everything we have, and that includes the robust, the robust, innovative commercial marketplace. And iSpace using those terrific red wire sun sensors. Yeah. Made, just, so, Jim, you know, we talk about commercial, we talk about this really second golden age of space that we're experiencing relative to the growth of Artemis and the program that's carrying the government as well as commercial. But let's talk about workforce for a moment, because there's such a limited workforce in America. You mentioned China, Jim. The numbers in terms of Chinese engineers, scientists, is startling. And the lack of STEM professionals is literally a national security issue for us. We talk about diversity and inclusion, not just the right thing to do, but the only way that America will succeed, that it's mission critical, if we don't engage all of us we will lose to the Chinese. I know this is an issue you care deeply about. If you could share a few yeah, words about workforce. The, the reality is that we knew when all three of us were at NASA that we didn't have we, the debt, the deficit, now inflation. The money was evaporating. And we knew that we had to go to commercial services. 
and it was how do you make that bend in the road? We're in the great transition right now to go to habitats, to go to independent space stations. Again, as Jim said, the Chinese, they're happy to collect our partners and have them come to their space station. But in the meantime, we've still got to incentivize our youth and inspire our, all our countries, all our partners for STEM engagement. So we have those folks. We're training the Chinese right now. We should be training our partners and Americans to be in those fields of engineering and science and all the rest. And I, 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 yeah, that's exactly right. And we have to think about what inspires the next generation. What is, what is that moment in time when a young person decides they're going to go into the STEM fields? And I think the commercial space industry, as much as anything, is is probably the leading, you know, tool of inspiration. We think about, you know, when we were, when we were young, we remember images of, you know, Challenger and Columbia and those kind of things. But now there's this new generation of young folks and they're seeing images of, of SpaceX and commercial astronauts from you know, commercial companies going not just, not just into suborbital space but into orbit and to the International Space Station and eventually to commercial space stations. I was at a dinner last night and, and somebody mentioned, they were like, well, is it too late for me to be an astronaut? And I'm like, it is not too late at this point in time for anybody to be an astronaut given all of the activities that are happening today. And, that is, a, that is, I think, very important for the next generation to remember. The, the, the opportunities are going to be boundless. So in terms of outreach to the next generation, Jim, I'd like to talk about two events that we did when we were at NASA. One was AwesomeCon, and the other is Future Farmers of America. Talk about those events and what you thought and why they were important. Well, yeah, we did Future Farmers of America, the national uh, event in Indianapolis, and it was uh, it was in the you know what is the the stadium where the Colts play? I don't remember the name of it. No one remembers where the Colts play. <laughs> yeah, well, mm -hmm. a, I'm in trouble now. But the the bottom line is a stadium full of people, and they were all there to hear about agriculture. And here we are at NASA, and we're saying, look, you know, there is a there is a capability that NASA can help in in creating uh, increased crop yields. Um, at a lower cost uh, and, and, and a saving of water. And, and how do you do that? Well, we've got missions like um, EcoStress, for example, where from the International Space Station, we can actually look at crops and see, we can see early uh, whether or not a crop is stressed. Based on the infrared signature, you can make a determination that you know, these crops don't have enough water. A farmer on the ground wouldn't be able to see that for weeks, but if we can give them lead time, uh, then, then there's opportunity there. The problem with the International Space Station for that mission is that it revisits maybe once every two weeks, which just is not sufficient. Um, so the idea is, look, if we can prove this technology works, can we then um, help private entrepreneurs capitalize it, launch it into space, and then have a farmer standing in his field go outside and look at his phone and say, my goodness, my, my crops are stressed, I need to do something about it. But EcoStress is one example. We're, we're using Landsat to do a very similar mission, um, using the uh, the electro uh, the uh, electro optical parts of the spectrum. So it's uh, there's a lot happening there, and and it's important for everybody to know that the technology is really just at the cusp of what could be, and it's going to be commercial, private sector that that advances it. And I think it's so important for everyone to understand that we go to space not just for discovery and science but to improve life here on Earth. At Redwire, we're a global leader relative to micrograv, biotech, crop, agriculture, new types of microchips. Microgravity opens up a whole new arena for scientific and commercial development. We just installed the biofabrication facility on the International Space Station. We'll be printing a meniscus soon. Who wants a meniscus, right? We all, all could use it, but I get so tired of the narrative of the billionaire playboys and commercial space only cares about money. The benefits that you just articulated to feeding the hungry, healing the sick, and benefiting all of us in ways we probably can't even imagine is so important. And I think we need to do a better job, all of us, of getting that message out, Jim. You know, Mike, and it started with the 1958 Act to help all humankind 
but to advance space science. It's in the act, that's what they were there for. And then you go to the, the multilateral agreement of 1998 with the French, the Canadians, ESA, the Russians, where again, we were to promote space science and commerce. That's what we're talking about with habitats. That's what we're talking about with new space stations. We've got to continue this. It's that transition I'm talking about. And the most important thing is that we have a seamless transition, that we continue the science that we're doing today so that entrepreneurs and small and large corporations don't see an up and down in their business model well, all of a sudden they can't use the space station for research and then start up again when these habitats arrive. We've got to have a consistency while the Chinese are continuing to try to capture that market share. We're really talking about space lanes of commerce. We're trying to keep free our space lanes of commerce that we've established. These two especially created the Artemis Accords which continue that, those space lanes in a free manner so that we can promote the markets in space. Wait, real quick, uh, you mentioned the billionaires, and I just want to be really clear. When people are criticizing a lot of commercial space because of the quote unquote billionaires, and there's a handful of those for sure, what they're really criticizing is private capital doing things that the government would have to do otherwise. We're talking about communication, navigation, the production of of food and energy and, and disaster relief and national security and weather prediction and, and understanding climate. What, what the private sector is doing, what these commercial markets are doing, is fundamentally sharing the cost with what otherwise would be borne entirely by the taxpayer. So this idea where we criticize commercial space activities as the playground of billionaires who instead should be feeding more of the world, in fact, that is what they are doing. And, and, and by the way, they're putting, they're putting their resources into something that's gonna be so much more transformational for the longest period of time, rather than just you know, handing out their, their cash um, you know, today. That this is transformational for the long term. It, and we needed, we needed them. Well, when we were there, it became very clear that one, the space station, very expensive to operate. We knew we could not do it forever. So we had to find a way to transition to commercial services. But also within NASA, you had the science mission directorate and the space exploration guys. And there was a lot of fighting going on in years past. And to Jim's credit, he neutralized that because we had to find ways to find the funding to fully fund science so they would support space exploration so that we could continue with the transition to commercial services which are now both at the Science Mission Directorate and Space Exploration. So they're all winners. But we had to do that to continue to move forward. I mean, what you know, the two of you did to help unite the industry and so many warring factions. Like, forget Republicans, Democrats, Yankees, Red Sox, Mars, Moon? Don't get those two people in a yeah. room. Right. I mean, that's a, a religious <laughs> debate. And again, as you mentioned, what was done Mars, Moon, science and human spaceflight, Democrats and Republicans. It's that unity that has allowed the continuity of the Artemis program to move forward. And to the point of the benefits of space, I'll never forget when I was at the agency, I was asked by a BBC reporter, how can you justify the billions spent on space when we're facing existential threats such as climate change? And I had to remind the reporter, we wouldn't even know about climate change if it wasn't for the NASA Earth observation satellites, if it wasn't for our space based capabilities. And we have put forward reusability in systems, beautiful rollout solar arrays to help create clean energy. NASA isn't just at the forefront, but it's absolutely vital to engaging and solving these problems. And again, I take ownership of that. I think we've done a poor job of explaining that to industry and the world. Yeah, and uh, the, a lot of the innovation is going to happen in, in, in commercial startups, quite frankly, where the most agility happens to be and, and in fact, uh, the most, quite frankly, risk-taking is. Um, and, and so we need to take advantage of that as a country. Um, it's also important to note, as you mentioned, 
uh, when we talk about el eliminating the divisions. I mean, that was, that was first. It's not moon or Mars, it's moon and Mars. It's not human exploration or robotic exploration, it's both. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not Earth science or space exploration, it's, it's both. Um, but then also bringing in the international partnerships and the commercial partnerships. I think it's, it's important to remember that industry to industry international is, is now going to be the norm for all uh, companies. NASA will continue to be a tool of diplomacy. Uh, NASA will not control it the way it used to control it because industry internationally is going to start working together because they're serving markets that are not necessarily NASA. And that ultimately is what's great for the American taxpayer. You bring in private capital, you have industry to industry, international collaboration, and then you go get customers that are not the US government. And all of a sudden you're getting a lot more capability for a lot less cost to the American taxpayer. All of that works together and you also get amazing innovation. Like you mentioned reusability for example. The innovation happens uh, when we allow entrepreneurs to do what they do best um, and that's the greatness of America. I, I've heard you say many times, Mike, we are not going to out centrally plan the Chinese. What we will do is out innovate and out entrepreneur them. And I've stolen that line just so you know many times. Don't worry, I stole it from Doug Levero. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of China, you know, we've talked a lot and at NASA we were of course civil space, but we executed an MOU with Space Force. And Jim, you know, your time in the Senate and you had a lot of exposure to national security issues. Talk to me a little bit about the threat that we're looking at with China, and particularly the dangers of falling behind in space-based robotics, in space situational awareness, and the role of the private sector in combating that and ensuring that we not only go to space, but we take our values with us of liberty, freedom, quality. You know, Mike, the, the reality is that the Chinese look at their way of living as, they look at it as a civilization. And in reality, we created our own civilization of freedom. And they're two very different civilizations. And they want to take their imprimatur and put it on the rest of the world. We want to continue to have free markets and freedom that come with it. And so, that's what we've been trying to address this whole time. We never talked about it a lot at NASA because that wasn't, our purpose was to giddy up, to get going, to go to this so that, you know, it, the, the old line is whoever leads in space leads the world. And right now we're in that competition. I'm not gonna say it's a space race, but there, there is a competition that is, is going to determine who leads this world. I, I, would, I would also say when you think about the moon and you think about, for example, the law and precedent regarding oceans, you know, we, in the United States, we recognize that nobody owns the ocean. You don't own it. But if you extract tuna from the ocean, you can own the tuna from the ocean. If you extract energy from the ocean, you can, if you apply your sweat and your equity, your resources to acquiring that, you can own it. And that becomes a property right, which enables so much more activity than if you didn't have that property right. And when we think about the moon, that's the future. And, and that's why we're doing the CLIPS program and we're saying, look, we want you to grab a piece of regolith and we will pay you for it. Even though we're not going to pay you an, a lot, we want to pay you for it for a reason. We want to establish the precedent that if you apply your sweat and your equity and your tears to accomplishing an objective, which is extracting a resource from the moon, you have the right to that resource. That is law and precedent that has existed for a long time here on Earth. It's law and precedent that needs to exist on the moon, and that means that we need to go and we need to establish that as a value system. Again, if you want to see people going to the moon, then maybe they're going to extract, maybe they're going to use the water ice to live and work for long periods of time. Maybe they're going to try to find large deposits of platinum group metals. Either way, you have to be able to say that you have that resource and that it's yours and you can utilize it. Um, and without that very basic principle, uh, we, we will not see the development of the moon. I think it was wonderful to see that Saudi Arabia actually pulled out of the moon treaty recently. And I think we've seen the accords and conversations move in that direction. 
I remember you always talking about, we used to think the moon was bone dry, so now I'm stealing your lines. And now there's so much water ice, it could fuel an entire new revolution and settle development. Now we're only discovering more water nodules, so it's amazing. But sticking with the threats from space, you know, Jim, you were always such a supporter of planetary defense. And now with the DART mission, utilizing the lovely rollout solar arrays by Redwire, had the dinosaurs had those arrays, they'd probably still be here to talk today. Could you speak to us a little bit about the importance of planetary defense? We've got Apophis coming towards us, which is going to come so close to Earth, it will be below, below geostationary satellites. So tell us where you think we need to head there. Yeah, so first of all, I want to be clear, we're all safe. Is that all right? Um, but I do think it's important for us to get a better and better understanding of the environment around us and make sure that um, we don't ever put ourselves at risk by not being aware of, of what's around us. Um, and so, yeah, the planetary defense is a key mission. NASA has been directed by Congress to do the research to uh, basically find all of the objects that could ultimately impact Earth. What we're now learning is that there are a lot more, you know, we think about the solar system, we all know where the asteroids come from and they're kind of all in the same plane and every once in a while one will come into the inner solar system. We can see all that, we can model it out. What we're now finding is that there's actually a lot more, um, a lot more objects coming from outside the solar system and maybe not within the plane of the solar system coming through in a way that we haven't seen before. So I think we've got to get better at detecting those. And I think we are, um, but certainly, uh, of course the risk there, the probability is a lot lower, uh, but, but we've got to get smarter on it. So uh, a risk that I worry about almost as much as asteroids you mentioned the importance of the public-private partnerships and how those have been the catalyst, the fuel that's driven this second golden age in space. I worry about us turning away from it. And particularly, Jim, you mentioned the transition from the ISS. We are at an inflection point between the government-run and operated platform and the commercial space stations. And success is not guaranteed. Could you talk about the importance of commercial activities on the ISS, of 3D printing, of tourism, but even if it's advertising or other commercial, how important that is to driving the future that we all want to see and relieving the taxpayer the burden and keeping America in low Earth orbit. Yeah, so when Jim and I were at the helm of NASA, we had a number of projects that I thought were really good. And we got criticized for it, but one of them was Adidas wanted to take some material up to the International Space Station to test you know, a new type of manufacturing of the sole of a shoe. And, and people were like, well, that's the, the, what, is, what value is that to NASA? Well, the value to NASA is if ultimately they decide that microgravity is a great place to, 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 to create the sole of a shoe, then others will do that as well. And at the end of the day, there's a, there's a robust commercial marketplace for that activity. And, and the, again, the, sh the cost can be shared between the government and the private sector. So it was worth testing. And, and by the way, when they did that, they then came back and they, they launched an Artemis shoe, which I know you and I both got a pair. I don't know if you got a pair or not. But of course not. I got, I got a pair for Christmas. And I will tell you, they're still untouched in the box in my closet. But the important thing is the Artemis shoe sold out like within a day. So if you didn't have an Artemis shoe on the day it came out, you're done. I, I got my pair, so I'm good. Thanks for worrying about that. But I would also say what was fascinating is after Adidas had an Artemis shoe, within weeks, Puma had a, a NASA shoe as well. Uh, again, these are, these are great things. I got, I got called to the Senate to testify about Estee Lauder on the International Space Station. And what, what a waste of money that is. Well, look, they are doing things with chemicals that have an effect on your, your skin and your, and your, your beauty, Mike. And, and here's what this is natural, by right. the way, believe it or not. I didn't no makeup. What NASA can do is 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 test these things. And if they end up to be, you know, valuable to those companies, there's there's a marketplace out there for that. We at NASA should should be focused on what are the applications that are outside the box for which we can eventually have a market that spreads the burden across not just NASA and the government, but across commercial and civil as well. And, and yeah, I got criticized. The Senate was like, what a waste of money. I'm telling you, 
we should be doing more of that. I got, I got criticized. Some of you saw that we were looking at putting a, you know, a famous actor on the International Space Station to make a movie. I think that's important too. Um, I watched the movie Top Gun when I was in fifth grade. Fundamentally changed the direction of my life. Uh, I think that's an important thing. Um, and, and these are things where NASA, in my view, needs to think outside the box, be very forward leaning. And the intent is not to get a return on every dollar. The intent is to grow the American economy so that innovators will continue to do what they do, innovate, entrepreneur, and ultimately keep us ahead of China. But at the same time, you also had your eye on the moon and Mars. And we were looking at 3D printing, AI, and how do we find a way to manufacture at habitats on the moon and in the future at Mars. And yes, we're doing 3D printing on the space station, but we've got to do 3D printing at the large scale of creating habitat on the moon. And those things are critical, what we're doing now on a small scale. So while you're doing the things you're talking about, you also, I know, were hyper-focused on the moon and Mars. Not only moon and Mars, remember, I unilaterally declared that Pluto is a planet again. And I want to be really clear. Who's up for Pluto? Who's on Pluto's side? Pluto for a is, in so fact, Pluto a finds. planet. And I will continue on. We now know that Pluto has five moons, a multi-layer atmosphere. The largest glacier in the solar system is on Pluto. We believe it has an ocean inside because of the way it's, it's wobbling. We know that Pluto has organic compounds, which are necessary for life that don't exist on the moon, but they're on Pluto. So here's what Pluto, for anybody here who questions, and the young people especially who are being taught falsehoods, Pluto is in fact a planet. Fake news on Pluto. They got, I can't help but you mentioned Top Gun, by the way. So we took Jim to see the Rise of Skywalker, the last Star Wars film. They played the preview for Top Gun Maverick. He tried to walk out of the theater after that. That's all he was there for was to see Top Gun 2. So we could go on talking forever. It's just a joy to get spend time again with the two of you. But let's turn to the audience. So who has questions for the gyms? Rodney. Yeah, come on up. So until uh, two weeks ago, I was the imagery lead for Artemis, and you uh, would often say the camera is the mission, which was music to my ears because I spent much of my time at the agency trying to retrofit imagery and cameras into spacecraft that didn't think about doing that. Uh, what inspired you to, to say such a thing and thank you because I used that as a bludgeon to make sure we had imagery requirements for Artemis, so thank you. Yeah, so that's a thank you for bringing that up. I, I did say frequently the camera is the mission. I, I think a lot of times people forget that NASA was intentionally created in 1958 to be de separate from the Department of the Army. At the time, the Army was lobbying hard so that NASA would be under the Department of the Army. And, and, and it, it was Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, who said, no, NASA is not going to be part of the military industrial complex. It is instead going to be part, it's going to be a tool of diplomacy. And we want to see NASA partnering with countries around the world and inspiring young folks. It was an entirely separate mission from the Department of Defense, which was the vision of President Eisenhower. Now, if we're going to do those things, if it is going to be a tool of inspiration, a tool of demonstrating that our technological prowess is superior than, of course, at the time it was the Soviet Union, but also that our system of you know, our economic system is superior, our political system is superior. If we were gonna do that, we had to have images. People needed to see what we could accomplish. And, and so yes, when, when I heard people at NASA say, there's no technical requirement for this, that, or the other, the camera, I'm telling you, that is the mission. Our mission is inspiration. It is making sure people are aware of the technological prowess of our nation. And, so the camera is critical. But, but I'd also add, while we were doing everything we've talked about, we also had to sell NASA. We had to sell NASA to the Hill. We had to get the funding. We had to increase the funding exponentially. So we were on a sales mission while we were doing everything else to get the excitement going, to have people excited. You know, Jim, every day, Twitter. I'm an old appropriator. I don't talk to the press. He forced me. 
I had to start, I had a Twitter person who basically I Twittered every day. It took me a year to get used to it. He calls it Twittered, just to be clear. <laughs> Uh, I, on the other hand, was limited to one tweet a day that I would force <laughs> with Jim, with our friend Matt Ryden. Uh, and we're so thrilled you know, here at Redwire to have done the cameras for the Artemis One mission, seeing just the manifestation of the dream that we all had of Artemis and to be a part of that, just incredible. And without those images, without the video from the DART mission, it just wouldn't be able to engage the public. You wouldn't get the funding. Again, just can't echo enough, the camera being the mission. But from those pictures, while Artemis is amazing, the commercial drive is amazing, one of the greatest accomplishments we had was bringing back the worm. Could you talk about that, Jim? Yeah, so uh, I think this was, this was shortly after uh, we did the, the high altitude abort tests with, uh, with SpaceX and a Crew Dragon, where they exercised the launch abort after it passed something like 50,000 feet or something. Um, and I went back afterwards uh, to the White House to have a meeting with the Vice President, uh, Vice President Pence at the time, and, and he was like, that was awesome, great work, it was fantastic. But he was like, we don't see, he goes, we, he said, we put $4 billion into this. There's no NASA on that anywhere. I said, well, <laughs> got it, well, understand, we'll go, we'll go make sure, we'll put some NASA on there. So I thought one of the things we could do that would jazz it up as much as possible is not just put the meatball on, but also bring back from my childhood. You know, everybody, everybody at NASA is divided. You're either for the meatball or you're for the worm. And of course, I was a worm generation kid. Uh, and so I said, let's, let's bring back the, it was retired in 1993. We brought it back. And now, guess what? We're bringing NASA together. We got the worm and the meatball on the same vehicle. And I think Unity, was, yeah. unity. Unity, but also you look at each administration. You know, one of the things I saw with the NASA employees, they'd ha how many times you'd have a major program that got canceled. And part of Jim's goal was how are we going to get Artemis so it goes into perpetuity at least, so that we continue the programs that have been established. That's what's so important at NASA is that, that continuity. When we're talking about the space station, it's the same thing. Continuity is key in every single area we were involved with. And it's something that we were sorely lacking. That during my lifetime, your lifetime, I think maybe Jim, your lifetime, NASA had been unable to sustain a beyond low Earth orbit human spaceflight program. When it came to beyond LEO human spaceflight, failure wasn't just an option, it was a certainty. <laughs> and Artemis is the first time that we were able to leap that chasm and go from one administration to the other. And I remember, Jim, when, when both of you were recruiting me to the agency, you talked about bipartisanship and international. And maybe the two of you want to talk a little bit about how we managed to create a program that could be sustained by multiple generations of administrations in the future. Yeah, so the, the first thing you mentioned earlier, you had to eliminate divisions. Wherever there are divisions, we need to bring unity, whether it was moon or Mars, human exploration, robotic exploration. And by the way, there's a, there's a lot of things like that at NASA. We, we needed to remove that as much as possible. Um, and, then, and then we needed to make sure that, that we had the bipartisan support to, to actually accomplish the objective. Now, the bipartisan support was necessary not just because we wanted to get a budget from the US, but every international meeting that I had, people would say, why are we doing this again? We've done this before. It always gets canceled. And they would give me example after example. So the goal had to be, if we're gonna do things that are multi-decadal in nature, multi-generational in nature, we have to have a political bipartisan support. We started doing town halls with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, senators on both sides of the aisle, uh, across the country to build that support for Artemis. Um, and, and then of course, once we, had, once we had public bipartisan support, then we go to our international partners, say this, one, this time it's different, which of course people say that. In fact, it was different. Our, high, our highest priority was when we go from one administration to the next, uh, which we all knew it's gonna happen eventually, we gotta make sure that, it, that ultimately it's sustainable. And, and I think we were able to accomplish that. Hey Mikey, I think we're getting the hook. 
I got to make one last comment, though, on the European and the partners on international. I remember at my first meeting with ESA in Paris, within two weeks of taking the job, and Jim Moorhart, I remember you saying, Mike's been here for two weeks, he's in Paris. Like, I've been in, like, Cleveland, like, last week. What, what's happening here? And ESA absolutely asked, why should we believe anything you say? They learned the phrase Lucy in the football. And the way that we proved it was the byproduct. I said, don't listen to me. You're absolutely right. Don't say anything I say. Listen to Senator Cantwell. Listen to what the Democrats are saying. And Jim, I remember, and I'm going to get this wrong a little bit, but there was a statement or a tweet from Nancy Pelosi after an Equality Day saying, go get that first one on the moon with Artemis that then Mike Pence supported. You united Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence. Let's have a round of applause for that kind of <laughs> unity. That, that's a Nobel Peace Prize worthy effort. So Speaker Pelosi and I landed on the moon together three times in the <laughs> vertical motion simulator at Ames Research Center. It was awesome. Um, she wouldn't take the controls, but she went with me. We landed on the moon. Um, we, we left, the, we left the, uh, the simulator. We did a press conference. I asked her to tweet about it. She did. Then I called the vice president, asked him to retweet her tweet. He did. And then I knew my job here is done. Like this, we now have an Artemis program that people love. Question from the audience. That's all right. I got it. So I'm a teacher. My name's Casey Hines. I'm a middle school science teacher, and I'm director of education for Limitless Space Institute. And I appreciate that you talk so much about STEM education, but our country's facing an education crisis. We have teachers leaving in droves. Um, but there is a small percentage that are here, the teacher liaisons, that we love STEM. We see the industry, and we know all the potential and awesomeness that is here. So how can we get industry to get more involved with teacher professional development because they're the front lines inspiring the future workforce? Uh, so I'll tell you the great question. The answer is um, you're, you're here and the Space Foundation has that as their core mission, which is inspiring the next generation, STEM education. So this space symposium is in fact a piece of that overall puzzle. So when companies come here, when they buy boosts, when they, when they, when they come to the, the symposium, the foundation uses those resources to do what, what you're saying. So I want to commend the Space Foundation for doing this, first of all. But yeah, it's, it's an all of the above effort. I mean, we have, to have, we have to have stunning achievements. That's what we have to have. You know, you walk around NASA, the folks that are old enough, you ask them why they're there, they remember when Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon and Neil Armstrong. Um, we need to have those moments again. My generation, uh, my, our, our memories are the challenge here in Columbia. Those aren't good memories. We need those stunning things that are positive, that inspire the next generation. Landing on the moon, sustaining on the moon, uh, landing on Mars, critically important. I'd also say we need to incentivize the universities where a lot of their funding, they get full rides from foreign countries. And how do we bring that back to Americans that can see those opportunities as they're matriculating up through high school and know that they can get a full ride in those universities? That's going to take funding from the government, most likely, to do that, or the corporations. Yeah, thanks for the question. My mother is a former math teacher. What about flying a teacher, flying a student? We talked about some of these ideas. Do it. I think that's what we need to be doing. Do, do uh, we have a volunteer already over here? <laughs> All right, other questions? Here, because, yeah, because uh, if not, again, I, I you know, can't, uh, it's, again, it's such a wonderful opportunity. Um, relative to, you know, having been gone from NASA, if there was one thing that you felt like we left unfinished that you wish we could tackle, what would that be if we were back at the agency? What, what one thing would you want to focus on or do that we weren't able to complete? Well, uh, so uh, Mars is critical. We, uh, I think we, uh, I'm not going to say I think. Um, the probability of finding life on another world is going up significantly. Um, we look at Mars, complex organic compounds all over the surface of Mars. The, the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars, could be geological. But I've talked to scientists who've said those methane plumes are sufficiently large 
to where they don't think it could be geological. It's got to be biological. We think about the discovery of water. Not, I'm not talking about the polar ice cap, which we know has been there, but I'm talking about liquid water, 12 kilometers under the surface where it's liquid and it's protected from the radiation of deep space. What does that mean? Wherever there's life on, where there's water on Earth, there's life. Is that true on Mars? We don't know, but we need to find out. But we do know from spirit and opportunity and curiosity, ingenuity, we now know that there are, that Mars was covered in water at one time. The northern hemisphere of Mars was two thirds covered by ocean. We, we know that it had a strong magnetosphere that protected it from the radiation of deep space because it had a molten core. We know that it had a thick atmosphere. We know that Mars in its past was habitable. The question is, was it inhabited? And is it possible that even some of that habitation might be there today? That's what we don't know. But here's what we do know. We have to go find out. Because when that discovery is made, it will add chapters to history books and science books. And we want that discovery to be made by the United States and a coalition of our partners, international coalition. So again, making sure our values are going forward. So I think that's important. But here's the thing. You asked me, what's one thing? If we're going to go to Mars regularly, we have got to go faster. We can't spend nine months on a trip to Mars, which means we need nuclear propulsion. We need nuclear electric. We need nuclear thermal. But ultimately, uh, if, if I had to do it again, I would have made more of an effort to get more nuclear propulsion uh, as, a, as a mission of NASA. And by the way, not be afraid to partner with the DOD, which also has a need for nuclear propulsion in space as well. Um, so I think that's that's one area where I would focus differently if, if I had to do it again. I'm looking at it a little differently. I, I was the deputy, so more like Barney Fife. And uh, I looked at it, I saw Jim. More like Mr. Spock. You yeah, were the okay. first officer. Jim had the vision. How do you have continuity of a vision that's li a living vision that's continuing to change with the times, with the culture, with the technology? We weren't able, we, you created the vision, but to institutionalize a vision is very difficult. If, if that could have happened, you know, then we have the momentum going even farther than it's going today. That would be one. The second one, I looked at the headquarters, headquarters in downtown DC, in the swamp, which Mr. Bridenstine accused me of being a part of many days. And I looked at it and said, we need a headquarters that's a smaller footprint so that the centers are really where the work gets done, but also connect the headquarters with a museum for STEM education. And we tried to do that, but it was trying to get it so that we were always promoting STEM at the headquarters level, level so the administrator would have always be pushing that and be it out of DC. So that, again, was something that we were trying to do. We just kind of ran out of runway. These are both great ideas and important points. And who knows what the future holds. So yes. yeah, don't, don't uh, put them on hold too much. Last question. We talk about the different factions. Most important question of all, Star Wars or Star Trek? Jim, I think I know where you're at on this one. My answer hasn't changed in the last 10 years. Uh, Spaceballs. Um, <laughs> Favorite, favorite character is Barf the Mog. He's half man, half dog. He's his own best friend, which I felt like I was when I was the head of NASA. Be careful or pizza will order out for you. M Mike, we know where your inclinations are, so I'm gonna have to pick it up with Star Wars because I almost felt like I was at the bar scene whenever I was in Washington. <laughs> the true creature cantina. Yeah. Well, folks, let's have a round of applause, not just for them coming, but for all these two individuals have done for NASA, for America and the world. Round of applause for Jim Bridenstine and Jim Moorhart.